So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for coming. You're most welcome back after what I hope was a relaxing and enjoyable summer. My name is Catherine Meenan and I chair the Germany group here. Um, I'm happy to say that we're starting with a bang and I think that you'll find today's event extremely interesting and very valuable. Uh, if I could just say in advance of everybody, please wouldn't mind turning off their mobile phones. I would also make the point that uh, this part of Dr. Lang's address, the public part, will be on the record and the question and answer session afterwards will be off the record on Chatham House rules. So we're very privileged to have with us today Dr. Joachim Lang, who is the Director General of the Confederation of German Industry. He has considerable qualifications in law from the University of Tübingen and Bonn and has also uh, graduated in European Studies. He's a background in the Federal Ministry of Defence, in the Chancellery, and worked in the Parliament in the Office of the Whip for the CDU-CSU Parliamentary Group. He worked in the Chancellery, and then he also worked for a number of years as the uh, Director General of E.ON, which is, as you know, the energy company, the publicly listed energy company. And he's been Director General of the BDI since 2017 and a member of the Presidential Board since 2017. So we look forward with great interest to what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, uh, for the invitation and uh, for having me here. And as I understand it, it's uh, the f right after summer. So um, the issue why I'm here is, um, is, is pretty easy. Thank you for the invitation and the great opportunity uh, of sharing views with you um, on this troubled state of politics and economics in our times. I will put forward some ideas and then look forward um, to your perspectives on those issues. Let me start with a view on the political and economic state of the world, then move on to Brexit, the trade environment and the policies and politics of the EU going forward. For those of you who might have seen uh, the movie The Dead Don't Die by Jim Jarmusch, let me paraphrase the key dialogue. This isn't going to end well, <laughs> says the policeman trying to stop the rot. How do you know, asked Bill Murphy. Jim gave me the script. It's the answer. And as I know my script, I fear that this applies to my speech as well. This isn't going to end well. Let us um, enter the world economy's uh, current horror show. After a long period of economic expansion in the world economy and in Europe too, slow but gradually taking up speed in 2017 and 18, we are in troubled waters once again. This holds true for slowing global growth and in particular for the pronounced slowdown in European economic activity. Germany is the leading star of the slowdown Industrial production is in the single digit minus territory already. This is the situation in advance of Brexit and Trump's tariffs on Europe. As you know, Germany is nowadays a forward-looking indicator itself as it is so tightly integrated in global trade, money, finance, data, and migration that any wind of change on the globe is immediately felt in Cologne, Munich, or at the headquarters of Adidas and Puma in Herzogenaurach. And winds of change, we have a lot. Unfortunately, those winds are not the ones of the revealing sort that we have experienced in a hot summer, but the cold winds of protection, populism, and techno-nationalism. And Germany is a rather small player in the current global set of conflicts. In other words, the US-Chinese conflict already hurts Europe strongly, and the nascent escalation of conflicts between the US and the European Union will make matters even worse. Consider the facts. Global growth will slow down this year to some 3%, the lowest figure since 2002, except for 2009 after the crisis. The conventional assumption of a return to higher dynamism next year assumes away Trump, assumes away Johnson, Xi Jinping, and other risks. In fact, Europe will find itself in recession next year if a hot Brexit takes place, 
and in a slow, moderate growth situation if it can be avoided. Global trade growth is back to stagnation. Enhanced policy uncertainty emanating out of Washington, Beijing, and London will dampen global investment spending substantially. In this and next year, even arriving at close to 2% growth in global investment, which the OECD expects will require dramatic improvement in policies of the US. We do not expect this to happen. Quite the reverse. Germany is a producer of investment goods, much more so than of highly priced cars. This is bad news too. Consumer spending, much sustained the global recovery for so long, is suffering from signs of weakness globally. This holds true for the purchase of new cars in particular. Manufacturing is in very sorry cyclical state of affairs. Growth in global production this year may well not exceed 1%. In Europe and Germany, we will see a decline. In other words, manufacturing is already in recession. Fortunately, construction, services, and the public sector still grow, but at medium term, um, but a medium term decoupling is less likely than many may think. We are heading for trouble. Global financial markets turned sour from benign neglect until June till historic fear of recession. Now it took only a few bad news. Global bond markets price in recession. Global stock markets lose their regained strength. Foreign exchange markets feel the punch. The yuan crosses the seven. The pound loses weight. The Argentine peso sinks to rock bottom. Looks great, not at all. Put together, we have all the ingredients at play that make for a perfect recession. This will be the first serious one in post-war history that is manufactured in Washington, DC, and London. 1973 and 1979, it was oil, inflation, and interest rates. 1990, it was security issues, Kuwait. 2001 and 2, it was global stocks and the new economy. 2008, it was finance again, this time housing and banking. And nowadays, it's bad economic policy, and this is clearly bad news. The game in town of this autumn is central banking. The Fed and the ECB must stem the tide, and the Bank of England is taking a grand stance in every difficult waters. How awful does it have to become that we must rest our hopes on monetary policy alone? Fiscal policy will squarely come into play this autumn. Of course, there are many highly indebted countries in the OECD area which have little leeway to act. Fortunately, Germany is not amongst them, but has the space and capacity to stabilize the situation if and when it turns sour. This will require a more complex redoing of German fiscal policy on which we made our points clear. Strengthening private and public investment is now key, and strengthening consumption if unemployment related to protection and Brexit emerges is a no-brainer too. We have to use the space that fiscal rules allow us, and there is space, and we must apply those rules. The German debt break and the stability and growth pact flexibly if the situation requires it. Chancellor Merkel said so, Olaf Scholz says so, we say so too. It will happen, but we have to do a lot of homework to make it work well. The most immediate cause of action in Berlin will be another round of bad news, starting with Brexit soon. Clearly, Ireland will be hit by Brexit in a unique way. None of the other EU27 countries shares a common border in such intense historical and economic bonds with the UK. And yet, the impact of Brexit will have a magnitude that will be felt on the continent as well. Germany's bilateral economic relationship with the UK is ample and multifold. BDI, therefore, has set up a task force with 10 expert groups and nine, uh, tw uh, 200 members coming from all parts of the German industry community and business community. Already last year, we have presented our policy proposals for the German government and the European Commission. And there were certain guidelines on which we have been clear about from the very beginning. Of course, we deeply regret 
the referendum result. However, German business has always been committed to the European project and the single market. It is true that Germany and Brexit um, will suffer from, from this, and the Brexit will worsen the access to Irish and German businesses' export markets. But these negotiations are not about our bilateral relations alone. Not surprisingly, our trade and investment with the other EU member states outnumbers those with the UK by far. But even that numerical perspective would be too short-sighted. German business depends heavily on the EU's unparalleled network of preferential trade agreements with third countries. Brexit will weaken our market access to our FDA partners. For instance, through existing so-called local content requirements, which will be harder to meet for European firms with production in the United Kingdom. We must make sure that we avoid further damages to the EU's trade relationships with other nations. This means we neither want to see rene renegotiations with other EU member states, nor do we want to jeopardize our relationships to other allies, especially in the European economic area in Switzerland or Turkey. If we do not live up to our commitments vis-a-vis -vis our closest partners, how should the world have confidence in the EU? We would damage the EU's reputation. Running trade negotiations in the future would be much harder, not just considering today's challenges. We cannot afford that to happen. Secondly, the four freedoms in the single market remain indivisible. In the long run, the single market will only work if the framework allows for a level playing field. The idea of keeping market access for goods and services, but not for capital and labor, is only possible in a full-fledged customs union or a preferential agreement of the Canadian or EEA type. In modern business models, for example, one doesn't buy simply a machine. It oftentimes comes with a setup, maintenance, guarantees, and financing. All these components require, among others, the free movement of people, capital, and data. Separating one component from another would halt these business models. How can you repair a machine without being allowed to send a worker on short notice? How can you use a 3D printer without data flows? These questions remain unanswered by the Brexiteers. The inconvenient truth is that Brexit rips apart already existing business models and production structures. It will lead to large numbers of lost jobs. Therefore, any references to supposedly problem-free trade uh, relations with other WTO members fall short. Also, sectoral accesses to the single market do not resolve the issue at hand. We have reiterated this position to the German government and the European Commission over the past month. In fact, we would clearly prefer continued membership, membership of the United Kingdom in the EU. However, as this appears politically unfeasible, we aim for a preferential trade and investment agreement based on a customs union. Given the red lines in London, we regard a traditional FTA as possible, which would be still far from optimal. It would fall behind the current state of play of integrated production systems and supply chains in manufacturing that depends on a working regulatory environment, standards, and also testing procedures. I'm making these points as we are aware that Germany and its business community are under immense scrutiny in the international media and public debate. Therefore, let me be clear. We, BDI, fully support the political declaration and the negotiated <laughs> withdrawal agreement, including the backstop. Despite all noise, all time pressure, and all the immense challenges for businesses, our stance has been undisputed in our membership, and it is widely acknowledged in the German Brexit debate. Here in Dublin, I feel the need to emphasize a few points with respect to the specific situation in your country. We, the BDI, stand firmly behind the backstop. We have a fundamental interest in keeping the EU's external borders permanently safe. This includes the enforcement of customs and single market rules. Again, a policy that lets goods and services flow into our market without any checks will be the level playing field at risk. 
Such policy is unsustainable. Until we have found a solution for a permanent border regime, we need an insurance policy. In other words, we need a backstop. And we reject any sort of expiry date. It would drive the idea of an insurance completely ad absurdum. All other published proposals protecting the single market and most importantly, protecting the Good Friday Agreement fall short. We count on the European Commission to evaluate any proposal that will be brought forward, whether it meets these criteria. It is first and foremost the Commission's responsibility to protect, to protect the integrity of the single market. Further, it is indispensable to keep Ireland as a full member of the European market and the single market. Any type of border checks between Ireland and the continent are clearly undesirable. Hence, an outcome that falls behind the backstop would not only constrain German-Irish business relations. What else? It must also be of utmost importance to the European Union as a whole that made in EU is globally recognized. If we establish separate rule books in one single market, we create a double standard. I cannot see how such policy can possibly contribute to European integration and the stability of our common market. Again, only the backstop will allow for this. Lastly, I want to make another point which is by and large unrecognized. We need macroeconomic stability. It must be clear that every form of Brexit will cause disruptions in Ireland, Germany, and the other EU member states. It is our duty to exploit the existing European framework and to do whatever we can to mitigate a looming recession. This includes workable solutions for a land bridge. Brexit will require us to conduct structural changes in the medium term. For those, we must equally be prepared. I have no doubt that Germany with our firm support, will demonstrate our strong commitment to our fellow European friends and allies. And be reassured how our country and your country will be the first to which we are so our solidarity. International value chains are not only challenged at the European level, but also on a global scale. President Trump's trade policy and the escalating trade conflict between the United States and China are serious threats to global economic growth and stability. Although the bulk of tariffs and other trade-related measures implemented by the <laughs> Trump administration are so far directed towards China, they also directly hit European companies. Our companies are impacted when they produce in and export from China to the United States and the other way around. The list of conflicts in the EU's EU trade relationship is long too. The Trump administration is obsessed by, with bilateral trade deficits, although according to official US data, the United States has had a positive current account with the EU since 2009. According to EU data, the EU has a small surplus, but the current account is almost balanced. The obsession with Bilateral balances in trade and goods, such as with Germany, is wrong. It completely understates how strong the United States is in trade and services. It also neglects the importance of primary income, for example, earnings of US affiliates in the EU. And it neglects the importance of the European common market. Germany, for example, sources a lot of US services from Ireland. I'm also worried that the dispute over aviation subsidies might lead to a further escalation of the transatlantic trade conflict. We expect a WTO verdict regarding the damage to the United States caused by EU subsidies later this year. If the United States decided to immediately implement retaliatory measures, and I hope it does not, this need to be WTO compatible and should not surpass the value which the WTO identified. The transatlantic relationship is a pillar of global prosperity and stability. Instead of repeated threats, the United States should constructively pursue negotiations with the EU. Removing barriers in transatlantic trade 
will benefit both the EU and the United States. In general, German business is strongly in favor of ambitious trade agreements. In the case of the United States, a step-by-step -step approach might be preferable. Better successful negotiations on separate areas than an ambitious agenda ending up in political gridlock. A step-by-step -step approach would also help to rebuild trust in the transatlantic relationship. In light of these two big storms, it's imperative that the European institutions will take on their work as soon as possible. German industry welcomes that the European Council and the European Parliament have agreed on a new president of the European Commission. Any delay would have paralyzed the EU institutions and would have caused political uncertainty and instability. It is now crucial that the EU institutions develop a joint political program for the next five years and comment swiftly with its implementation. The new president of the Commission, von der Leyen, outlined her political priorities for the next legislative term in her speech before the European Parliament in July. From this and her political guidelines, it becomes clear that the new Commission will place a strong emphasis on climate, environmental and social policy. The BDI stresses that in times of increasing tensions in the global economy and sobering economic outlooks, a comprehensive European economic program for boosting growth, job creation and competitiveness in the EU is of utmost urgency. Only with a strong economic base, Europe can find solutions to the big challenges such as fighting climate change and safeguarding the European welfare state. The BDI welcomes that EU member states have called on the Commission to develop a European industrial strategy in March 2019 which the Commission has already started to work on. The BDI has recently presented its vision for a future agenda for Europe 2019 until 2024, comprising industrial policy priorities. It is important to bear in mind that though they constitute important elements of industrial policy, a comprehensive industrial strategy needs to go beyond environmental and climate policy, also taking the following aspects into account. A modern industrial strategy needs to be founded on strong governance. It should be implemented by a commission vice president and supported adequately by the council. The EU institutions should develop and implement an ambitious action plan for the completion of the single market in all areas, most notably the digital single market and the single market for industry related services. To strengthen the competitiveness of Europe, Investments in trans-European transport networks, the digital infrastructure and European energy grids need to be more consistent. The European competition regime should be strengthened by promoting cooperation between businesses, improving merger control proceedings, taking greater account of the global competition in merger decisions and focusing state aid rules on stimulating investment and innovation. The digital transformation to the economy must be supported by establishing a common European data space. Focusing on industrial digital business models and implementing Horizon Europe in an industry-friendly fashion. Last but not least, we will only manage to build a sustainable Europe if we succeed in aligning the goals of industrial policy with ecological goals in the further development, for example, of the gas sector. The circular economy and mobility and climate and environmental policy need to be thought together. One of the major issues of our time is climate policy. Fridays for Future is a popular demonstration in Berlin and in Dublin. And Greta Thunberg had just sailed alongside the coast of Ireland to America. German industry supports the Paris Treaty and the European climate targets. We want climate protection. But we want to shape it in such a way that the European economy and industry is strengthened and not weakened. If we want to be the architects and builders of a new climate neutral world, we need innovation and investment in the first place and not just new taxes. In Germany, we presently discuss how to design a future CO2 pricing for better climate protection. The German government will take a decision in this autumn. We propose a concept which stimulates the necessary new investments in each single sector, energy, 
industry, buildings, and transportation. We are convinced that this cannot be achieved by introducing a simple CO2 tax or by enclosing transportation or buildings right away in the existing European emissions rating scheme, as price sensitivity in the various sectors is very different. To give you an example, car drivers will easily pay 30 cents more for their gasoline, in contrast for tenants or course a corresponding increase of their heating costs might already be problematic. And finally, for energy intensive industries on a global market, such a rise of energy costs could right away lead to insolvency of the company. Therefore, we need a CO2 pricing system which takes the differences of the sectors into account and is combined with other instruments as tax incentives, funding or subsidies. And any new pricing system must not touch the sectors in the existing EU ETS, but cover only other sectors such as transportation and buildings. In the long run, we might achieve a common CO2 pricing system for all the sectors in entire Europe. But in the meantime, we will need a differentiated system which allows to be socially fair and economic wise. By the way, these are also fundamental preconditions not to lose public support for the long-term intergenerational project to reach climate neutrality. These are the points that I wanted to mention besides uh, the Brexit, and thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to discussing with you now. Thank you.